So, welcome everybody um, to our first, I guess it's our grand opening, sort of. Uh, so do we have any patients up here yet? Any bachelor patients? Anyone know? Selena? No? Maybe one. Not yet? Maybe one? We had one. Okay. Dr. Petrozelli is doing a radical neck on one of my patients, and Dr. Cohen is down there chiseling the karate box. So maybe, um, maybe he can come up here. Um, so anyway, I was asked to give a little discussion on sort of perioperative, postoperative care of the vascular patient. Um, and I came up with some, I put together a talk. I had, had a talk that I give to the perioperative nurse in, in the OR, to, to the interns. And so I modified it a little bit for y'all. Um, go to the next slide. These are some of my titles here. Next slide, these are the rest of my titles. This is what I do. I am a rocket surgeon. Um, but not really, because what we do is not rocket science. It's very, it's, it's really simple stuff. Um, and taking care of our patients is pretty straightforward as well. Next slide. So, um, we do multitask. I'm multitasking a little bit too much today. I, I love, I found this on the internet. I love that. I tried to get a picture of my desk, which has a commode and a computer and my telephone, and I couldn't, couldn't get that picture to download. Um, but I, this is what I believe in, and that is that multitasking is a terrible, where the master of no trades when we do that. But anyway, uh, next, next slide. Okay, so I'm, I'm a huge believer in keeping it simple. Okay, this is how I live my life. I try to, and this is how I want everybody to live their lives, especially when it comes to taking care of our patients, and that is keep it simple. So post-op care in these patients really should be simple, and that is, is this expected? Is it unexpected? Is it normal? Is it normal? Because, and I tell the residents this, if we ignore anything that's normal or expected, okay, those patients don't need our attention. The ones that do need our attention are those that have fallen off the curve. Next, so this is the distribution of variance. Y'all remember this from statistics and everything. These are the patients that we, this is what we want. And these are the patients that we pay attention to. Okay, these are the ones where we want to, we want to pick up on. The ones that are falling off the bell curve that are the standard deviations above the line. Next. Really simple. So expected, ignore. Normal, ignore. Not ignore, but go on to something that's, 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 that's uh, we'll take your time. The unexpected and the abnormal, what we really want to figure out. Next. <clears throat> this is the answer. Find X. Here it is. There it is. Next. Oh, I have a point. Oh, look at that. in the mail yesterday. <laughs> because I found out that I am the in charge of general emergency general surgery at Canner Hospital. So, <laughs> in, yeah, so the company that's well, this university that's doing the survey sent me this as a as thanks for for participating in the survey <laughs> as the wow. head of emergency general surgery at Canner. Who knew? I should have put that on, on my title slide. Okay, so a little history. Vascular surgery is relatively new, and for what we know. We've ligated vessels back in the in the uh, uh, prehistory, cauterization in the Middle Ages. Endoterectomy wasn't until the turn of the last century, the 1900s. Um, bypass came out of wartime, World War II, and then the Korean War especially, if y'all remember MASH. Um, but until that time, we really didn't have good vascular therapy. Um, prosthetics didn't come about until the 1950s, and that's all textile uh, technology that, that we rely on. Um, and the endovascular revolution wasn't until the 80s, and the endovascular grafts that we use for aneurysms not until really 2000. So this is all pretty new stuff. Next. How is vascular surgery possible? Well, anesthesia is a huge deal for us. Um, not until we, we can we could put patients to sleep and do local, regional, and general anesthesia. Could we do any of these operations? Blood banking was huge. Aneurysm surgery before the era of blood banking was not possible, um, as you can imagine, because those patients, before, before blood banks or even during blood banks, those patients get six units of blood in general. Now that we have the cell saver, most of it is cell saver blood, but you know, we needed six units of banked blood to do these cases when I was arrested. Um, Anticoagulants, because anytime we stop blood flow, the blood clots. Okay, even though the blood vessels have an anticoagulant lining, 
um, when it's when blood's not flowing, then you have, you set up the stage for coagulation. So heparin, coumadin, warfarin, and the, the 10A inhibitors, uh, Lovenox, Orixtor, which is actually a 10A inhibitor, um, and then the newer drugs that we hear the lawyers advertising, Xarelto, Alpha, Protaxel, um, is another one too. Um, the interesting thing about most of these is that they're reversible. These are not yet. The newer drugs are not reversible, but will be within a year. Antibiotic therapy is also very important for us. Aspirin, the best drunk drug ever discovered um, from the bark of a birch tree, I think. Um, Plavix, all kinds of different <coughs> variants on, on, on these antipathic drugs. And antibiotics. So the, the antibiotic era ushered in our ability to use prosthetics and use it safely. Prior to that, homograph was all we could use because of infection. Okay, so open vascular surgery. These are the things that we do the most, and this is kind of what will be coming up here, I imagine. So carotids, aortic surgery, um, this is kind of going, getting to be less and less, but we still do open aneurysms. We still do aortic bifemoral bypasses, and we still do aortic branch vessel surgery, renal artery bypasses, mesenteric bypasses, mesenteric interventions. Uh, but more and more going towards endovascular. Lower extremity bypass is still something that we do quite a bit of. Um, and we'll talk about that. Analysis access is something that's really outpatient surgery, so probably wouldn't be coming up to the floor. But we'll talk a little bit about that. And I probably won't talk much about endovascular today. We can do that another time. Okay, carotid and vaborectomy. So 1954, first described by this group in London. Dr. Rob then became the Chief of Surgery in Rochester. Um, Dr. DeBakey, interestingly, did the first one in 1953. Didn't report it for 20 some years. So his first report was on 20 year follow up. So we know it's a good operation. The techniques really have not changed from what he did, really. Indications for carotid surgery have not changed really significantly since the studies in the, published in the late 1990s. And that is an asymptomatic diameter reducing stenosis greater than 60% in those patients who are on, otherwise on maximum medical therapy and are at good risk for surgery. And a symptomatic carotid stenosis, <coughs> TIAs, or even a stroke, greater than 50% in those patients who are at good risk for surgery. The goal of operation is prophylaxis, it is to prevent a stroke. So unfortunately, if you had TIAs, it doesn't fix what's happening. It does, if you've had a stroke, it does not fix what's already taken place. And that's a hard thing for our patients to understand sometimes. And it's one of the few times in surgery where we do an operation to head off a problem. You know, if you have a hernia, you go have it fixed, but you don't go have your hernia fixed if you think you may have one in the future. So this is, and that's why we don't just rush in to take care of these patients, to operate on these patients, because the main risk of endotorectomy is we could cause a stroke. Okay, a little intraoperative stuff, head of the bed's elevated, we, uh, we turn the patient's head away. General anesthesia mostly here. Um, that can be done under regional um, and local. Um, we don't really do that. That's sort of a system issue. Um, none of us really feel that comfortable with it. Um, so we don't do it, but it's possible to do the operation completely under local. Patients awake, you can tell you if they're having some issues. You can ask them questions. You can give them a squeaky toy to squeeze to let them know that the opposite arm and leg are still working. Um, next slide. Um, we're gonna go through these really rapidly. This is intraoperative stuff. That's the incision. The patient's head's up here, chest down here. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Yeah. Next. A little incision through the platysma, and there's the vessel there next. Vessels with internal carotid, external carotid, and the common carotid next. This doesn't project very well with the light, but this is the plaque, and you can see it's very irregular. The plaque's been cut open, so the blood flow lumen is right there, but this is the plaque that we're taking out. It's irregular, frequently filled with what we call toothpaste. It looks like uh, yellow toothpaste. It's just full of cholesterol crystals and Rod did. Next. This is a shunt put in, put in place uh, to carry blood around where we're working during the time, and that's the plaque being lifted up. And you can kind of get an idea of how ugly that is. And that's where platelets will stick and then form a little blood clot 
and break off and go to the brain and cause a TIA or a stroke. Next. Plaque's coming out. This is the cleavage plane that we leave behind. This is actually everything, almost everything in the blood vessel is gone. The intimal layer, which is thin and filled with this plaque, the medial layer, which is the smooth muscle, is all gone. And this is kind of the basement membrane and the adventitia, which provides the strength. Um, to our closure. That's important. I tell the students or ask the students all the time, what's the strength layer? And it's the adventitia. And why do I care? I care because that's where my stitches have to go. If I don't have that layer, my stitches are going into nothing and it'll pull out and then y'all will be calling me in the middle of the night. Next. <laughs> There's the plaque. Next. This is a bovine pericardial patch and we almost all use that patch. Um, it handles kind of like vein. Um, it's off the shelf, it's easy to use, um, and it has excellent durability and results. And we do think that it is more resistant to infection. Next. Here's the patch in place. We patch almost 100%, I patch 100%. The data would show that a patch, an, ar an artery that's patched, has a lower risk of perioperative and long-term stroke. The primary closure, which is just closing the blood vessel back, put the way you found it, with the plaque removed, has a higher risk of stroke and a higher risk of restenosis post-op. So the data would show that, that this is best. The VQI data, wouldn't it? Yes, That's it does. That's pre-VQI. Okay. And there's the incision. So not much to it. <laughs> Most patients will have steri straps and they come up with the dressing in place. Next. I don't have a picture of the dressing. Go back to what you want. So they have a cover derm on here. One of my pet peeves is drawing on my dressing, okay? Because I, I don't care that there's blood seeping out on my dressing, okay? What I do care about, and what you all care about, what you're really trying to show me is that the patient's having bleeding. So if the bleeding, if the, the dressing's bloody, take it off. Let's get a new one on, let's assess the patient and look at the neck and make sure that there's nothing hiding under here. That your bloody dressing is not just covering up this tremendous hematoma that's getting ready to compromise our airway. Next. Okay, post-op care. Pretty simple stuff. So the head of the bed at 30 degrees. Okay, most of these patients, they come from, from PACU and they're alert, they're oriented. They have a normal neurologic examination and we want to continue to, to monitor that. Head of bed up will help minimize swelling. Um, you'll go on the internet and see some some um, protocols. Some people use ice packs on the neck. I'm not a big believer um, because ice actually lowering the temperature decreases the effectiveness of our hemostatic mechanism and so it increases the risk of bleeding. It doesn't, and ice doesn't help much in pain control either. Um, clear liquids is tolerated. Really no reason for these folks not to have a, a little something to drink. They're going to have a sore throat um, from the ET tube and from what we did. It's fine for them to have clear liquids if they're alert. And um, pain control, uh, most of them will start with acetaminophen, Tylenol. Very few of us will be using um, IV Tylenol, but on some of the bigger operations we will. This operation is just through the skin and platysma. It's not real major, so patients shouldn't need a lot of pain medicine. If they have preoperative pain medicine requirements, we may need to help them do this, but Tylenol first. And if they fail Tylenol, then we'll go to something like hydrocodone or oxygen. <coughs> Very unlikely that they'll need anything stronger. We do send patients home with a prescription, though, because we can't call those in anymore. Um, so if they, if they go home and they need something strong, they're kind of stuck unless they come back. So we'll send a, home, a prescription um, for something, 30, 30 tablets or something. Blood pressure control is very important. We want these folks to be normotensive, and that may sort of mean what, they, what their normal blood pressure is. We certainly don't want to lower it. If they, if they live in the 150s, we don't want it to be 100 when they're in the hospital. 120 might be even pushing it, but sort of normal blood pressure for them. But we certainly do not want them hypertensive. So anything 160, 170, we're going to get antsy about and we're going to treat. And that's in our, in our, our order set. Uh, we treat primarily with beta blockers um, and then with some, uh, with some other medications, clonidine being, being ubiquitous as well. Um, all patients are on antiplatelet therapy. That DAPT stands for dual antiplatelet therapy. The cardiologists use that as well. All patients should be on aspirin and Plavix pre-op. We don't stop those medications. And we continue them. Most folks, we continue Plavix for about six weeks post-op and then transition to aspirin alone. 
um, not really good data on the use of dual antiplatelets um, beyond that in stroke prevention. Um, probably doesn't hurt. Certainly does not. Hopefully does not increase bleeding risk. Um, and these we really don't see much of a, a problem with patients on dual antiplatelets. But everyone needs to be at least on aspirin, if not both. And everyone needs to be on the statin. Okay. Statins are neuroprotective independent of their cholesterol lower. So no matter what your cholesterol is, anyone undergoing this operation should be on a statin. And we try to start this pre-op, um, and everybody should go home on, uh, if they were not already. Almost all of our patients go home the following day. Okay, so it's, it's really, it is as close to outpatient surgery as we get um, in, in vascular. Um, there are centers that do it as an outpatient with a six-hour monitoring window in the PACU and step-down <coughs> unit and then home a couple hours later. I'm not a big believer. A lot of our patients come from a long way away. Um, and that's just that, that, that little post-op um, overnight stay doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt the uh, bottom line for the hospital. So we keep them home. What about neurologic complications? Okay, so the, we do this operation for stroke prevention. The big risk that patients want to know about is we can cause them to have a stroke. Okay, that risk is low. It's surgeon dependent. Um, it should be in the one to two percent range, but it's certainly not zero. What do we look for? So, most of these patients come to the PACU and they're awake. They may not be fully with it, but they're awake. They can follow commands. So, down the road, we're looking for their level of consciousness to be the same and improving. We want them to be appropriate, answer questions appropriately. Confusion may, may point us in the direction of abnormal convalescence, where we want to uh, pay more attention to those patients. Maybe something as simple as hypoxia, or hypotension, or could be signs of some cerebral malperfusion, the kind of thing we want to know about. Motor function, we're not looking for fine motor function in these neurological examinations. We want to know that the patient's moving the contralateral extremity. Okay, so we do a right carotid. We want to concentrate on the left arm and leg. Can you squeeze? Can you give me a thumbs up? Can you give me two fingers? That sort of thing. And if they can follow more complex commands, they're doing pretty well. Sensory, um, a little bit less straightforward to examine. Patients will generally tell you if they're having numbness rather than you discovering that on your own. Um, I don't think we really ever see that much, but that's part of the neuro exam. If the patient's complaining, of something we need to pay attention to. And cranial nerves. And I put the cranial nerves that in, in here that we deal with in the carotid endorectomy. Seventh nerve is the facial nerve. So have the patient smile. Make sure the smile is symmetric. Frequently they'll get a little lip drag on the side we operate on. That's from us pulling on the marginal mandibular branch. Um, that usually goes away um, post-op. The ninth nerve is the glossopharyngeal nerve. It has um, the function of the gag reflex, and some swallowing, very subtle changes. We can't really test that well. The tenth nerve, the vagus nerve, is the one most frequently injured in carotid surgery. Um, that would be manifest by a recurrent nerve injury, um, unilateral vocal cord paralysis, um, hoarseness, severe hoarseness, um, a breathy voice. And the twelfth nerve, that's the easy one, that's the, that's the uh, hypoglossal nerve. That's a big nerve. We see it um, routinely and during the operation and protect it. It's, uh, it controls the tongue. So tongue protrusion, that's not nice. Um, it protrudes to the side of the lesion. So if we operate on the left and the patient sticks their tongue out, it goes to the left, we pull it on the nerve. It's okay, it'll, it'll recover. Um, some patients do have some swallowing difficulty, speech difficulty, but it's very unusual for that to be an issue. Very rapid recovery. There's a pretty rare complication called cerebral hyperperfusion, and that is more common in patients who are baseline really hypertensive, um, and patients that have very tight stenosis, so 90% very critical stenosis. So what happens, we think, is with, with this hyperperfusion is that we have opened up the vessel, they get very rapid increase in the perfusion through that carotid artery that the brain is not used to. And those blood vessels are maximally relaxed because they're, they've been trying for years to get normal blood flow. Now that they have it, they don't know what to do with it. So the, the vessels are maximally relaxed. There's increase in perfusion to the brain. There's swelling. Um, and 
can have some pretty significant neurologic complications. Patients usually complain initially of a headache, pretty severe, and it's a, it's a headache, it's not scalp, it's a real brain ache. Um, a lot of our folks will complain of scalp ache, especially on the back of their head where we've um, pulled on some of the occipital nerves, but this is not a scalp ache, this is a headache. Um, maybe um, accompanied later by seizures. We'd like not to make it when it gets to this, this point, but if we make the diagnosis there, if we're, we're kind of out of luck. The treatment is to control hypertension, okay? So we control these patients, we make them normotensive, 120s, 140s would be fine for those folks. And like I said, common in patients with very severe hypertension going into the operation and very severe stenosis. Next. How about wound complications? So the things that we most, that we probably see more often are things like this, hematoma. So an expanding hematoma is a big problem, okay? No drawing on the dressings. If we're concerned, let's take the dressing off and look at the patient, okay? Just so you can look at them and see if they're symmetric. Um, a, a real hematoma will get your attention. It's not some mild swelling. You don't really have any, there won't be any question in your mind that there's a hematoma. We're talking about something like this. Um, patients may have some difficulty swallowing from that. Um, patients will frequently complain of difficulty swallowing after surgery. We have to sort that out. Is it because they had an ET tube, because we we're messing around in the throat, or is it hematoma? And it's usually not a heart attack. Once we get to this point, when the trachea is shifted over to the side, that's a surgical emergency. So anytime there's a concern about a hematoma, I need a phone or the residents need a phone call, and someone needs to come see that patient and make an assessment. If we think there's a big hematoma, we go back to the operating room. We put them to sleep, intubate them, open the hematoma, and take a look. It's almost never arterial bleeding, almost never. It's usually venous bleeding, and it's usually stopped by the time we get to the operating room. So we still need to evacuate the hematoma, take a look, make sure the suture line's intact, make sure there's no bleeding vessels, and get all the structures back where they belong, back to the midline. The other wound complications we almost never see. Infection, very rare. Y'all will never see that in the, in the one or two days post-op. It just doesn't happen. Um, the neck has such rich blood supply that infection is very rare. It's not unheard of, but it's very rare. And wound dehiscence, I'm not sure I've ever seen it. The only infection I've seen, I've seen one since I've been here in Savannah. I had one in Augusta. It was from an infected patch um, from a um, intraoperative ultrasound probe cover that was not properly sterilized. It was not sterile. Um, but that's the one time. That's a real disaster. If the prosthetic patch is infected, that's a real disaster. The patch has to come out. The bovine patch does not become infected in general. Carotid uh, Dacron patches are, we've had problems with in the past. But it's, it's very, very, very rare. Okay, next. All right, so we're going to go on to aortic surgery. Is a nice slide from this patient, I think, probably was not a surgical patient. Um, most common location for aneurysmal disease is at the bifurcation. This is the belly button. This is the tip of the xiphoid. Okay. And, and bell aortic can't go, go back this one. Keep going. And bell aortic aneurysm, we do aorta bifemoral bypass, and we do some branch vessel surgery, mesenteric, renal, iliac, mostly combinations with the aortic operation as well. So these patients will come here from the ICU. Go ahead. All right, for aneurysmal or occlusive disease, prosthetic is almost always used. Started back in the 50s with parachute nylon, then Dacron polyester, just like our clothes. We use knitted. The thoracic surgeons use woven grafts. Um, they're all impregnated with collagen or something so that they're, they're watertight. Um, Gore-Tex, just like our raincoats, um, made of expanded polytetrafluoroethylene, um, we use primarily in branches and in lower extremity, but we do use it in the aortic as well. Indications for surgery, an aneurysm greater than five centimeters in a good wrist patient, <coughs> iliac aneurysm greater than three centimeters in a good wrist patient, and aortic iliac occlusive disease, claudication. Free. It's unusual for the patients with aortic disease to have rest pain, but they may. Um, so claudication, those patients who have trouble walking can walk 100 yards or less, have iliac disease. Aorta bifemoral bypass is a great operation, especially in the younger patients. 
next. Interoperative photos covering the operative site with eye band <coughs> to protect the skin or to protect the prosthetic from the skin. Next. Midline incision. Next. Go through this rapidly. That's the that's the aneurysm right there. Again, it doesn't project very well. The duodenum is up here. The left renal vein is in this location. Next. That's the aneurysm open there. Obviously, there's a clamp on there. Um, suction free. Next. And here we we've sewn in a graft. This is a this is a Gore-Tex graft. You see, it has this dotted line. That's the idiot stripe, so that you can keep it oriented. Sewn in above the aneurysm to the to uh, normal tissue, um, generally right below the renal arteries. And the renal arteries you don't see, but it, they're right here. And this is a bifurcated graft, so it's a pants with two legs. Okay, next. This is the left limb. No, the right limb. Excuse me. So here's the aortic prosthesis here. The left limb has been tunneled to the groin. Here's the right limb getting ready to be tunneled. Next. Femoral anastomosis. Next. <coughs> There's the graft sewn in right there. Idiot strike so we don't twist it. Next. Okay, what about post-op care on these patients? Well, this is pretty similar to any major abdominal surgery. We'll throw some vascular stuff in there, but it's really abdominal surgery. So patients will come out with a Foley, an NG tube, central line, a lot of maybe some large bore IVs, and we'll quickly try to de-device them as we are able. Okay, so frequently the NG tube is the first thing to go. Um, we don't always leave it in, but frequently will at least for 24 hours, and always NG. We always have to get anesthesia, or take it out of their mouth and put it in their nose. Um, Foley catheters. I know there's a big push to get those out. These patients are pretty pretty stove up, so we leave them in a day or two. Um, but like I said, we'll de-device as they're able. Pain control, almost all of our patients with abdominal surgery, we would love to have an epidural. Um, it makes their life and our lives very simple. Um, not all patients get it. Um, they may have not stopped their plavix uh, in time uh, for surgery or for whatever reason. And those patients, the PCA is going to be their lifeline. Um, we use fentanyl PCAs fairly routinely. But with an epidural, we can frequently transition these patients from the epidural to PO to home within 24 hours. Um, so those are great. Um, there's some other benefits of epidural in terms of early um, return to normal GI function, normal pulmonary function, and it has beneficial effects on our lower extremity bypasses. Not, for, not the aortic ones, but the lower extremity bypasses. The data would show that epidural has beneficial long-term durability. Um, most patients have a midline wound. You may occasionally see a flank incision like a transplant. You may see a transverse incision in rare, in rare occasions. The biggest thing that, that is different for us is the groin incisions, okay? Either longitudinal or transverse in the skin crease. The groin is where the infection comes in, um, and graft infection is an absolute nightmare, so we want to take real good care of these incisions. We usually leave the dressings in place for two days or more. Frequently we're using those long-term silver impregnated dressings, the five-day dressings. And unless they're soiled and nasty, we'll leave them in place for five days, hopefully to get some extra healing. When we take the dressings off, frequently we'll paint the groin incision with betadine, or Dr. Sussman loves that uh, vial, gentian violet. Um, no data, but it does keep the wound dry, and, and, and it, it does decrease the uh, colony count. Next. What, what's particular about the vascular patients? Well, the pulse exam is what we're concerned about, okay? And pulse exam is kind of one of those things that seems to be fairly subjective. I like to not for it not to be. It needs to be really objective. Is it there or is it not, okay? Not is it one plus, two plus, four plus. Who knows what that means? Is it there or is it not? If it's there, great. If it's not there, is that a problem? It may not be, okay? It may, but the change is what we really need to pay attention to. So I like to say, if it's present or absent, that, that doesn't leave room for interpretation, okay? And I think that a handoff, person-to-person -person handoff, to check each other is, is vital. So I'm in the operating room, I feel pulses at the end of the case. I go to the PACU, tell the PACU nurse, feel the pulses here, right here, feel it with me. She agrees, she, he agrees. So we've handed off person-to-person. -person. I get a lot of phone calls, at shift change 
reporting to me what the previous nurse said to the oncoming nurse, not what not not what they had had confirmed with each other in person. So I think the person to person handoff is ideal at the bedside, especially when it, when it comes to pulses. Had a patient, you can come hear about it tomorrow morning at m and had a patient over the weekend, two weekends ago, um, trauma patient, no pulses. Yeah, I thought we thought we felt pulses. The transition team thought they felt pulses. Hey, it feels better. Pulses were not there. The patient ended up having a devastating problem. We want to make sure that we hand off and that we're absolutely sure. If there's a question, call me. Call the surgeon. Get us to come check with Okay, what about perfusion of other organs? I guess we're concerned about some of the organs too. Urine output is a good way for us to check renal perfusion. If we've done renal artery bypasses, we'll want to make sure the urine output is adequate. If it drops off and we want to know about it, we may want to investigate. Mesenteric perfusion. So patients that have an early post-operative bowel movement after an aortic operation, that's not good. We don't bowel prep our patients as much as we used to. And sometimes it's just the stimulation of surgery, but if they have an early post-op BM, we're concerned, especially if it's bloody or, or black, we need to know about it. That usually happens post-op day zero and one. Usually patients still in the ICU. Um, once, they've, once they've left the ICU, we're less concerned about that. But that may mean that they've got some colonic ischemia uh, that needs to be addressed. Sometimes when we do aortic operations, we reimplant the the inferior mesenteric artery, which is the blood supply to the colon, to the sigmoid colon. Um, and if we didn't do that, those patients may be at more risk. The blood supply is generally very rich. The collateral blood supply is rich. So this is a, a thankfully rare complication, but it is one that we look for. Next. This is another complication that we look for. Um, this is really bad. Um, this is trash foot. This is when we take the clamps off the aorta and we didn't appropriately flush the blood vessel, the patient went fully heparinized and trash goes to the foot. Um, I've thankfully not seen this in a long, long time. Um, but this is something that's not real slow. Um, by the time the patients get up here, you guys are not going to be calling me about this. We, I've already known about it. This, though, it can be found all the way up to the butt. So uh, patients can, can slough anywhere from the perineum to their, to their legs if we if we have embolic complications like this. Next. Okay. How do we get these patients home? Okay. Tolerating a diet. They do not all have to be eating real food, but they need to be eating. They can't get dehydrated. Okay. The pain needs to be controlled with oral medications. Um, can't send them home with an epidural or a PCA. Bowel and bladder function need to be returning towards normal. Okay. Um, most patients um, should be moving their bowels. Uh, without difficulty, I'm not a big fan of colase and the other um, things. Our residents love it. I don't send patients home with prescriptions for stool softeners. If they need something, they can take milk and magnesia or something like that at home. Bowel and bladder function normal. Safety. PT and OT will see most of these patients and they will tell us, right, is the patient safe? And that is, can they do their ADLs with the available assistance? And that that's the big thing. That's why it's underlined. Our patients are elderly, their spouses are elderly or dead, okay? If they don't have good assistance at home, we should know that really early. And any deficits, we need to make alternate plans. So are they going to go to inpatient rehab? Hopefully. If they don't qualify, are they going to go to a SNF for some lesser rehab? Or do they need LTAC? We don't use LTAC much, but we do occasionally. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that we need to get out post-op day one. PTOT need to be on board and helping us figure all this stuff out. Okay, next. Lower extremity bypass. What are our indications? Um, claudication is the disabling leg pain with walking. It's in the muscles only. It's not in the hips or the knees or the ankles. It's in the muscles. Calf muscle, um, because they're the biggest muscles farthest away from the heart. Critical limb ischemia, which is a, a, a larger proportion of our patients. That is rest pain, pain in the in the foot with rest. Um, it's relieved with standing up, hanging the foot off the bed uh, at night, or frank tissue loss, ulceration, or gangrene. Okay, these are kind of no-brainers. These will be a lot of our wound care patients that will end up up here as well. Um, what do we use for conduit? Autogenous conduit, greater saphenous vein is the best and lasts the longest. 
We also use um, prosthetic. Um, Gore-Tex is the most common. Sometimes we use some cryopreserved homograft. Um, very, very expensive. Durability is not as good. You would think that a vein would be good, but it's really not. It's, it's probably not uh, economically viable. Um, but we do use it on certain occasions. Next. Okay, here's a here's an incision. One of Dr. Cohn and a venous patient. This incision from the groin all the way down here. Okay. I try not to do that, but sometimes we have to. That's the saphenous vein. Next. Clip in the side branches. Next. There's the conduit. So we can take the conduit all the way out of the leg and then tunnel it where it needs to go. We can take it from one leg and put it in the, in the opposite leg uh, if we need to. We try to use the vein in the same leg if it's there. If they've had a cabbage and the vein's been removed, then obviously we can't. Um, but we try to stay in the same leg. Now we can also leave the vein where, where it is, where it belongs. That's called leaving it in situ. Um, and you don't have to actually mobilize it fully. You can just make an incision at the groin, expose the vein, make an incision in the calf, expose the vein, make an anastomosis, make an anastomosis, and leave the rest where it is. What's the problem with that? Veins have one thing that arteries don't have, mainly valves. So veins have valves that prevent blood from flowing that way, towards the foot. So we have to lice the valves. And that's one reason that people take the vein out, because you can flip it around, you don't have to worry about the valves. Anyway, next. This is the distal target. There's the vein harvest incision. The vein's gone. There's the posterior tibial vessel there, tiny thing, three, four, three millimeters at the most. Next. Femoral again, next. Plaque coming out of the femoral artery. Next. That's the anastomosis of the femoral artery. Next. Okay, so post op care. These patients are fairly simple as well, but we don't want them to do certain activities. So most patients will stay in sort of a beach chair kind of position, head of bed and the, and the, and the knees raised, sort of a semi fowler beach chair, I call it, um, to keep tension off the groin and off the knee. Um, but they can get up and move around otherwise. Um, they can get up by post-op day one. Frequently we want these folks up that night, walking around, taking a few steps. Not, not <coughs> absolutely necessary, but they, they, they can. We don't want them sitting straight in a chair. So no, no chairs like this. They can sit in a, in a recliner or something, but no straight chairs, because we don't want those 90 degree angles. Um, epidurals, perfect for pain control in these patients. Um, and as I said earlier, those two asterisks mean that epidurals increase the patency of our bypass. So if we have an epidural, that patient's going to do better statistically with a, with a vein bypass. Probably not a prosthetic. All patients are on a cardiovascular risk factor modification protocol. That is aspirin, if not dual, with Plavix and a statin. Okay? Um, all these patients have to be discharged on these combinations of drugs. Um, sometimes we will use other antiplatelet therapy, including <coughs> Pletol, uh, which is Solostazol. We use some other antiplatelet agents, Brolenta, um, Effiant, there's some other names. I can't keep them straight. But anyway, antiplatelet therapy and a statin. How about the wound? A lot of times these are long wounds. These can be a huge problem for us, so we keep a close check on these. The dressings usually come down on post op day one or two. Um, and then we want to look at them frequently. If the wound's up in the groin, we'll probably paint it with betadine to keep it uh, dry, especially if the patient is not thin. Um, pulse check, again, present or absent, yes, no, <coughs> hand off with each other. We should palpate, and if we're not sure, yeah, I think I feel it, maybe not, always get the Doppler to check. If it's a strong Doppler signal, that's good. But if, the, if you think there's a change, get someone to confirm it with you. Get me, get it, get the rest, and get someone. Um, we do have grafts that go down perioperatively, usually within the first 24 hours, but sometimes, sometimes a little bit later. Um, that usually means a technical problem with the bypass. Early thrombosis is technical problems. Those patients will go right back to the operating room, and we'll try to fix it. Um, down the road, patients who lose their pulse, and I see them in the office months down the road. 
That's usually due to progression of disease because unfortunately we have no treatment for atherosclerosis. We only have modification of risk, which is this, and bypass, which is for the symptoms of, of atherosclerosis. There is no treatment for atherosclerosis. Next. Okay, what about the vascular complications? The five Ps of this patient is in trouble. Pain, sometimes if the bypass goes down, they'll even break through with an epidural. Um, pallor, the leg's cold, it becomes numb. It gets cold, poikilothermia, that's the key. And pulse assist, this is where we really figured it out. We're doing pulse checks with vitals for the first first 24 hours every four hours, and then we may go every eight hours or so. Hand off face to face to confirm one shift to the next. That would be ideal. Next. Okay, how about discharge? These patients may be even more challenging, I think, to our case managers and, and our um, therapists. Everybody needs to have good pain control, oral medications, cardiovascular risk factor modification protocol, aspirin, if not dual, and, and a statin. And that should be on all of our, all of our uh, discharge um, paperwork. It's one of the things we're graded on in our vascular quality initiative, our national database. All these patients have to go home on the appropriate medications. Um, are they safe? with available assistance. And because we're doing leg bypasses and a lot of these patients are having difficulty walking or have wounds, that may be the big issue. So a lot more of these folks will be going someplace other than home. What wound care do they need? If they have a wound that we've treated or have a partial amputation or, or whatnot, then what wound care is going to be necessary? Do they need to go someplace that has advanced wound care? Do they, will family be able to take care of it? Will home health nursing be able to take care of it? Those issues we have to get figured out so that we can make the appropriate disposition. Okay. Okay. Um, dialysis access probably not as important for y'all. You can <coughs> see some of these patients. Our protocol really is official first. That's the national push, but catheter last is what we what it really means. And that is, we want these patients to start <coughs> dialysis with the fistula, but and not with the catheter. Unfortunately, patients come here. They don't know they're in renal failure. They all get a catheter, and then we play catch up. Hemodialysis can be done with an arteriovenous fistula, which is autogenous, a bridge fistula, which is a prosthetic, or a tonal catheter, which is bad, um, and peritoneal dialysis. Dr. Walls and Dr. Garden do <coughs> peritoneal catheters. This is an excellent way for patients to do dialysis. It is more physiologic because they do it every day. Um, this is three days a week, usually, in center, three days a week. Patients feel terrible after dialysis. They feel good the next day, and the next, and the following day they're at dialysis. Not a great way to live. This is much more physiological. Next, um, this is a graft operation exposing the brachial artery. Next, brachial artery there. Next, uh, brachial artery there. Gore-Tex graft. Next, tunnel from there to the axilla. Next. Anastomosis next. Here it's completed next. That's it. I think I did. Uh, come to the slide should be done. I think I had a summary slide. Uh, well, we should be right. Oh, no, I took that out. Never mind. Okay, that's, that's the end of my slides. Um, so, any questions for me? To summarize, I'd say that everything, we, we need to know what's normal. And that's, that's the name of the game. So once we know what's normal, we can figure out what's abnormal, and then we can call attention to those patients. Um, it's really not hard stuff that we're trying to do. Okay. And we're, we're a big team, so phone calls. Um, I was going to put, that was my last slide, all of our cell phone numbers. Okay. <laughs> that, that's what goes up there. Leah, all of our cell phones. Um, so Leah will distribute the cell phone numbers on a laminated card for y'all um, so that you can call us directly. Calling the office is a real, that's a real pain. You'll figure it out. You do it once, you'll know not to do it again because you'll be on hold forever. Um, but you can call us directly for anything. Okay. And the residents you can call. Michael, who's not starting for another month, you can call. Yes? Yes, yes, no? December 14th. Yeah. I'm getting
Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to start month, two days ago, starting on the 14th. He's our nurse practitioner for the service. That will be helping coordinate everything. <coughs> Questions? Answers? No. Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you all very much. Thank you.